Hi, everyone. It's John and Julio, and we're back again with the continued explanation of Stephen Wolfram's blog post. This time, we're going through models, um, things doing human-like tasks, and also, like, we may get to a brief explanation of neural networks. Thanks, John. I'm super happy to be here again with you. And I cannot wait to dig into this because I, I, mean, I work with neural networks every day and I'm, I'm really hyped to, to explain this to somebody, somebody else that doesn't know much about them yet. Okay, so this section that we're starting on is what is a model? Um, let's kind of dig into it. Um, I guess kind of my first thing is like, how applicable is like taking a model from kind of classical physics and using it to explain models in general? I think that that can be done, but this way you explain a particular class of models. If you want to define model, the model is a representation of something else. And it can be a representation of an object, of a process, of the behavior of natural elements, uh, description of natural law that governs how objects are moving, for example. So a model in physics uh, is typically a mathematical model that de describes interaction between objects. Model in general could be something like the, the model of a house, which is not necessarily a, a something from physics. If you're looking at human-like tasks, then uh, you're probably interested in uh, a model of a brain which is gonna be a lot more complex than the typical physics-based uh, physics model. So maybe something in between, like uh, in the model of the house, you don't know what's in, like you don't care about the fine details. In the physical model, you go like as small as possible typically. I guess at this point you want to stay a bit in between, but the, the power of the physical, uh, physical models is that they are like mathematical models. So we offer, they offer a framework which is very powerful and very precise to solve them. So a couple of these diagrams here are kind of interesting with the different fits of models. So what happens when you kind of try to overfit a model or underfit a model with an equation that, that doesn't seem to match? Can you tell me more about that? Yes, okay. So when you, I mean, a model is, uh, of course, it's not a real thing. It's a simplification of the real thing. And then the question is how much and in which direction do you simplify? Of course, like this model here is a line. And from school, you know that it's just a couple of, of, of parameters, a couple of numbers you can tune to move it up and down, to change the angle. Of course, it's, it, the, the data that you're trying to, to model has something like a curvature. A line is never, never gonna pick that up. So in this case, it's very difficult to overfit. You cannot you know, be super precise on the data and ignore extra data, but we, you will always underfit. This model doesn't have enough capacity to learn this task, to, to describe the, the data as it is. So you want a more complex model. And in this picture, you see a model that has just the right amount of complexity. This is like a, a parabola, it's a piece of parabola, and it can perfectly describe the, the data that are underneath. Uh, this model here, where we use like an, an inverted function, like an in inverse function and the sinusoidal function. This is like, uh, you know, as a plus, it's like a, more functions and we can add parameters and things, but there's no oscillating component here. So I created like a bigger model that uh, is not really able to capture the, the essence of the data here. So I, I'm, I'm trying to simplify in the wrong direction. And uh, then you asked me about overfitting. There's a slightly different thing linked to having too many parameters and going like too precise on just the training data that you see. But I think that's a, that's a question for a different time. So now we're looking at human-like tasks. And my first question is kind of simple in a way. I think we all kind of maybe have an intuitive understanding, but what comprises like a human-like task? I think, I can do maybe a little better than the intuitive understanding, but probably not much more because the human-like tasks are necessarily fuzzy tasks, multimodal tasks where you, for example, 
combine information from different channels, you know, like images, audio, uh, tactile perception of things. And uh, in, in these domains, uh, machines have not been super strong, like giving interpretation to external stimuli when they are not very precise. They are great at measuring, but uh, in terms of like, oh, what is this? Is it a lamp? What exactly defines the lamp? That's kind of a made up concept that we decide. So the fact that something is a lamp, it, it has to kind of has to do with the way we think, with our logic. So these human tasks are, that are difficult for machines are at this, at this juncture, when you, at this junction. When you, when you have these external stimuli and they, you, you have to match it up with the way humans frame the world around them. And what we have here is a vision task. And uh, similar to what I was saying about the lamp, we have digits. And how do you decide that a bunch of colors on a screen, on a page, is a specific number? So we now have a problem where we're looking at how we as humans recognize different digits. Now, it's easy for me to like look at like single digits and recognize them. But how would a machine approach that, that problem? What's that about? Okay, so we've been talking about models. You need a model for this task. And you get inspired from what we do as humans. We don't know exactly, but we know that you know, it starts by seeing the digit, by seeing like colors. You, know, you, you, you need some contrast. You need like a black digit on white, uh, uh, like what we see here on the screen. And, uh, and then we transpose this into the machine world. So in the term of computer images, these are pixels. So this is a list of uh, one where it's white and zero where it's black. So you get a vector of numbers. And da -ha, a vector of numbers is something that the machine can analyze. So then you need some mathematical equation, some formula that reads in the vector of number, process it, and then spits out what the digit actually is given those list of zeros and ones. So now we're looking at some of the things that Stephen talks about in terms of blurring the digits. And so as like a human, when I approach this, or I look at it, I have this um, prior information and context. So I kind of can cheat in a way, given my experience to know that it's a two or um, that if you blur the image of maybe a seven, um, I can tell that it's actually that seven because again, I know it's a digit and I know that. How do machines kind of deal with that if they don't have any information? Um, and how do you create models? Um, and what does that have to do with kind of the model performance if, if they don't necessarily have that information? So this is an interesting question. Uh, is it true that you have a much larger context? And this is actually something that is coming up with these large language models. These large language models are building a huge context in terms of uh, like human, human written text uh, that is helping with their task. For this specific model, the, the task is to identify digits. And uh, in a sense, that it, there is an implicit context. So this model can, it's true that it doesn't have all your extra knowledge, but this model can only recognize digits. So from the, the view of the world of this model, is that every image, every black and white image is a digit between zero and nine. So uh, this is kind of helping. So we're moving on to neural nets a little bit. What is a neural net? Like, what is this about? How does it kind of work broadly? Okay, so first thing, if you look into this problem, what, what, what is being used here to solve this problem is a neural network already. So if I copy paste this into, into my local notebook, I can run it. I can actually show what this is. This is the Lenet model trained on digits. So I can just run it and, uh, and I can show you what the model is. This is very similar to what we saw already for, for GPT. And you kind of see that this model is a specific type of neural network, is a chain of operations. This means no, no branching, no kind of multiple input, multiple output. It's just an image coming in, process, 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 process. Each one of these layer is a processing step. And then some output coming out in terms of a class, 
which is 0, 1, 2, 3, 9. Okay, so in your explanation, you mentioned layers and like you unfolded this and there are a lot of these things. What are layers and what do they do? Huh, layers, what are layers? Layers are groups of identical operations performed in parallel. That means that uh, when an input comes in, in this case, the image of a digit, then I'm applying one operation on the image and then applying a variation of the same operation and another one and another one and another one. And all these operations, these individual neurons, they act in parallel and they form a processing layer. This is why we call them layers. And, and you can see that the name changes. So this one, this layer has 20 units performing convolution. This layer has 20 units performing the ramp operation, the pooling operation, and so on and so forth. Now, do these layers agree? How do they, they work together? They don't have to. They are completely independent. And um, and this is this is the, the kind of the metaphor of a neuron in the brain, where it comes from. So this whole thing is inspired by research on brain. And uh, the same way as in, in the brain, you have a neuron that gets input from the other neurons and gives output. And then you can collect outputs from multiple neurons and, and send it uh, forward to be processed again by more neurons and more neurons unless you have a satisfactory result. So here you do the same. You're just saying, I don't know which one is going to give the correct part, maybe all of them. Maybe uh, each, one, each one of them is going to take a small part of a problem. And, uh, and you basically create a structure that has some freedom, freedom to learn how to solve the problem. Gotcha. So you mentioned again, like the biological comparison to neurons. How do we think about like this same task in the human brain versus this machine brain? Uh, I'm not super strong at that because I'm not strong in neurobiology, but uh, you could imagine that you have uh, uh, neurons in the visual cortex, like for example, the neurons in your eye, they all perform the same operation or like similar operation in terms of being excited by light, being excited by light variations in time or light variation in space. And they're gonna be different from uh, the neurons that are processing what comes in from you, like the vibration coming in through, through your ears. So we have like specialized neurons that perform specific tasks. And like in the neural network, you have like specialized units, specialized layers that perform specific tasks. Now that we have more of this concept of a neural net, how do we actually make neural nets do recognition tasks? Okay, let's start. Let, I mean, let me follow. Let me follow Stephen blog here and start with a simple example. Mm -hmm. So here we have a very simple task. I mean, it's simple for a human, which is I have a space, 2D space, and I want to divide it in three parts. One part I'm going to label with the number minus one. One part I'm going to label with number zero, and one part I'm going to label with number one. So I, ideally, I would like a model that takes in a 2D point from this 2D plane, and then gives like a, a, the, 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 correct, uh, the correct end result, minus one, zero, or one. So if I, if I look at it in colors, I may want like coloring like this. Or if I look at it in 3D, adding one dimension for the for the the correct answer, I might want to look at a picture like this, where it's zero constantly here, minus one here, and one here. Are you fine if we go with this problem? Might yes. that answer your question? Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay, so here we have like a, we introduce a very, very simple network. So what is this? This is um, like a bunch of neurons. So each one of these represents one of these computational units. And these two here represent the input. So they're not doing any computation. They're just providing the, the coordinates of my point in 2D. So one is gonna be X and one is gonna be Y, for example. And these four are my first layer. So this is a kind of open up version. We can do it in a very simple network like this. In general, you don't do this, but in this case, we can do it. Uh, this is gonna be my first layer. So you see each one of these, is, is taking an input arrow 
from from both of them, and then it is giving out the result. So um, so th this one here will contain basically my, my my answer for this particular unit in this particular layer. And then I do it four times, and then I do it again three times, and then I do it again one last time, and and then this is a struct that provides the answer, and and this will give my a number at the end. And I hope that is the right number, that if I'm here is minus one, if I here is one. So I have a question based on the previous model that you expanded that showed the, the different layers. How does that actual model correspond to this diagram of this neural net? Well, some, some of those layers can be seen like this, like, uh, some operations like elementary operations are like just straight arrows in this diagram, but some other operations like convolution, they do a special thing in the spatial domain. So as I said before, only very simple networks can be expanded this way. You stop doing this when the model becomes too complex. Also because these, the, the number of these dots, the number of the neurons will be very, very, very high. You will just basically see at the bunch of arrows that will cover your whole screen, not very informative at all. So now when we look at these arrows, like what do these arrows mean and why the different colors? Okay, so these arrows represent uh, operations. And in the case of these simple model, these are these represent what is called linear layer. And so these represent linear operations. Remember when we saw the models before, we were looking we were looking at the model of the line, this one here. This line has two parameters, the slope and the intercept. Yeah, so like these are two numbers that, that can be fixed to, to, to learn your problem. If you go back to our network, then the color of these arrows represent the slope. So it can be positive, negative, can be close to zero, can be far from zero. So these, if the arrow is thick, that means that the value is high either positive or negative. And uh, I believe here that positive, okay, is, I use the same color function. So you see one is red, minus one is blue. So blue is negative, close to yellow is around zero, and red is positive. So basically this is taking the input and, and this thing here is representing the slope. So it's multiplying by something in this case that is close to zero, here that is negative. This one here is one of the biggest, it's strongly positive. So that means that the connection between the input and this neuron is uh, take the input, multiply it by a big positive number, and then add something. The add something part is impactful, but actually difficult to visualize together. And so you, we, we visualize only the, the slope part here. Okay, so we've, we've seen this neural net in a couple of different ways. How do you actually train these neural nets for use on these tasks? Well, there's specific procedure, which is called uh, uh, backpropagation together with gradient descent. I think that's a big topic that we could probably go uh, and analyze a bit more in detail uh, in a video on its own, if you're curious about it, where we can kind of go on a quest to find out how do you place the correct color on these arrows? That sounds really good. Thanks, Julio, again for this session. And I'm looking forward to the next session. No problem. Thanks, John. Till next time.